beg you more enough. Otherwise, we are turning our backs on many of the regular day-to-day -day users of that park. And that would be a sad opportunity. Very sad. Can I just ask, just say one thing? Uh, I mean, we're, we're asking in a way of the parks department, if there is a way that the need, the, the great need stated by so many here, that that is primary. Nobody wants to hold up Roe, New York. Just a footnote, it may be my ignorance, but 1.5 million covers what restroom? Are there three bathrooms, urinals, what? What is it covered? Is, it, is there a possibility that the public uh, can use it two or three or four people? Or what are we talking about for 1.5? And then how can we get the parks department to uh, allocate that and to assign that? This is a great project. There are gonna be a lot of people and something like this is so obvious in the area uh, for all the reasons stated. I think there might be some confusion. The money that was allocated for the restroom project that was a part of the um, a education pavilion, there's no more education pavilion. There's I see, no okay, gotcha. So we, are, we do not have any designs, any plans for any okay. restroom which puts an exclamation point for us as operators of the park for 20 years, that when you bring a beautiful building and structure to the park, anybody is gonna see it and assume they can use a restroom when in fact they can't in the design as proposed. And that we feel is really unfortunate. What's more unfortunate is if parks did not tell Roe New York in the reiterations of, of the design changing, that yes, you should probably include a public restroom. That still baffles my mind, that there was no discussion there. If not for NYRP reaching out directly to Rachel at Row New York to say, hey, can we figure this out? This design would be in front of you with no public restrooms being voted on for final permission. And that's a fact. If there are no more um, comments from commissioners, uh, uh, we need to take a, a roll call on this item. But remember commissioners, um, when I call your name, you can vote to approve, reject. You can vote to table the item um, or to abstain from the vote. Um, so there are possibilities um, of moving forward um, without, um, with any one of those items. So, um, if there's no more uh, comment, um, I will uh, call your name. Um, and after which, as I said, approve, reject, table, or abstain. Ken Seth? Uh, table. And uh, I would table this until there are public restrooms included in some way, shape, or form. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lori? I would vote to table this because it seems as if this, this is not resolved still discussion going on here even though i really support the building tremendously i just think we've got to iron this out karen table manuel approved susan table ethel table merrill Uh, Mary? Table. And uh, I will vote to table as well. Um, so it's, um, if my math is right, it's seven in favor of tabling the item, one in favor of approval. Um, so the item um, is tabled. Thank you. Okay, do we have Signy back? I'm readmitting her. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a contract. 
I'm sorry, we're not speaking anymore on that project. Uh, we'll follow up with parks after this at a staff level. Yeah, okay. Signe? Give me one second, I have to give you control back. All right, I'm back. Hello. Hi, Signe. I think we're ready to start. Uh, on the, uh, the project before me here. Okay. Sorry, yes, yes. Alrighty, so moving right along. Uh, the next uh, public hearing item are numbers 27893 and 27894, the construction of Rego Park Library and the installation of an artwork at the library. Uh, applicants will give a combined presentation on both items. Then we'll have public testimony on both projects will be heard. And then we can add, then we the commissioners can ask questions, deliberate, but we'll vote on each item separately. Okay, can we unmute uh, Marion or Michael? And I believe I've given you remote control. Thank you. And then when this presentation is finished, I will um, transfer remote control to Katrin for the artwork, but it's all combined in one presentation. So go ahead. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon and thank you so much for uh, taking the time to meet with us and uh, thank you to the PDC commissioners. And this project, the Rigo Park Community Library, Queens Public Library, uh, we've been working with Queens Public Library and DDC uh, for some time on this. And, uh, and as part of our team and Michael uh, and Freddie and I will share this presentation, we've been supported by project managers, Cliff Balch and Matt Ferraro, uh, project architect, Jackie Krasnikovskaya, and then our design team, Mark uh, Youngman, Tiberius, Madison Butler and Starkey Achevedo. And we, if I'm not quite sure about the, uh, how to advance the slides. Um, with the so um, you can, I, there should have been a pop-up asking you to take control of my screen and then you can use your arrow keys. Um, I had tested this with Matthew and it works. So can you? Um, show me the control. I'm, I'm just saying you can control directly. I, it says you can control Grace Hunt. So then, yeah, so you can control, that's right. So now use your keyboard, arrow keys, or use your mouse, try that. Okay, both are not so effective just now. Maybe if I could just allow you to advance, would that work? Okay, that's fine. Okay, fantastic. Um, this uh, this image is really showing you where all the Queens Public Libraries are in, the, in our public site, uh, our project site, you can see dotted. Uh, next slide. And it, you know, it's a very dense uh, area that in many ways has the benefit of having so much public transportation around it. You can see Long Island Railroad, uh, the subway, and if you go to the next site, you can see that um, it is really nestled in a tree-lined neighborhood on one side where you can see Austin Street and then a very busy road, 63rd Drive. So if we uh, zoom in, you can see it's a, a, an incredibly interesting neighborhood, uh, very varied in terms of scale, but it also has that kind of quintessential Queens neighborhood that I think we always associate with the kind of Garden City movement, uh, tree-lined streets. Um, but 63rd is very bustling. It's a very commercial street. It's extremely vibrant, very active, uh, full of life. And um, we are replacing this building, which, um, as you might know uh, and imagine, uh, the libraries have become uh, such important community hubs that this building can no longer function, uh, given its uh, scale. So we have a corner site, which we're quite excited about. Uh, so it does have a level of prominence. Um, but the existing building, as you can see, essentially one room, uh, has just, uh, for all the right reasons, uh, outlived its purposes. Next. And uh, similarly, a rather undistinguished uh, profile. Uh, so what we're really trying to do is kind of capitalize on the corner site uh, to kind of sculpt the building to break down both its scale and give it a kind of crystalline quality, but also introduce a level of uh, engagement with the street itself. Uh, there will be a green roof and we'll talk about that as well. 
So this really gives you a kind of a, a gestalt of the program. Um, the public areas are facing both uh, Austin and 63rd, um, and they're connected through a, uh, an entryway to the support and staff areas that are uh, just to the west. Uh, the inflections on the building allow a kind of dynamic reading so that it really has both prominence from all sides as an identifiable landmark. And yet you'll see that it's shearing uh, along its public area to get draw light into the areas that uh, draw light through the teens, adults, and children's and stack in the staff areas as well. Um, all of these are conforming to the zoning envelope that you can see on the right. Go to the next slide. On the ground floor, uh, this is the adult reading room uh, to your right uh, with the double height space uh, in, that, in the uh, upper right corner that draws light into the, uh, the teen area. The entry vestibule pulls back uh, and with the main stair and you're gonna be hearing um, from Katrin uh, Sigurd daughter's uh, artwork in that central area. And you can see the checkout area with the supporting uh, managing offices and book re return as well. Go to the next image. Um, on the upper level, the children's reading room uh, is, is uh, reached by the lobby and to its side is a right overlooking the lobby is a smaller multi-purpose meeting room. And then early childhood uh, has a benefit of overlooking and looking out on the street uh, through the very large window that we'll talk about a little bit further on the massing and the models. Uh, staff lounge is to the left. And then on the lower level, a major multi-purpose room uh, and the teen re reading room, which on the upper right-hand side is getting the benefit of the double height light uh, that uh, comes from the, the corner of Boston and 63rd. The green roof, which Michael uh, mentioned is, uh, which you can see here on the east wing, um, is a seat and roof. Uh, go to the next slide. And you'll see that as the building shears, it also extends up uh, on, the, on the west wing. Uh, and as the massing goes up, not only does it bring light into the central area, but it also naturally screens the mechanical equipment. Uh, which is on the southwest corner. You start to see here, we've got uh, three trees here. Uh, one existing one that we'd hope to save. I think the arborist has suggested that we might want to go with three new trees and we'll be working with the, uh, the parks department to find just the right one, but you'll see also the area for uh, bike racks and the trees uh, are planted in a permeable paver, uh, lot paver. And then as you look around on the busier street, uh, we're sustaining and maintaining uh, those elements and also working uh, to keep the access clear uh, from that you see on the north. So the next slide, uh, again, the, the lighting, which you can see here, we have an up light that actually lights the, um, the flag uh, and then a down light, which actually uh, keeps lighting at the book drop. And then uh, we have uh, recessed lights uh, that you can see around the sidewalk area. Next slide. Um, in this section, what you can start to see is the, the kind of uh, the sun color above for the children's reading room, the adult reading room, and the lavender, the teen reading room, and the slate blue. And then in the rows, you have the multi-purpose spaces. So you can start to see how the how we are, are leveraging, even though we have a lower level uh, light and uh, double stack sections to draw connectivity. Next slide. And then here, as we're going through the staff areas, uh, you can start to see how the service wings are are organized as well. Um, the next slide. And then uh, here you can start to see again, uh, cross sections, the east west sections showing how the children's reading room, adult reading room and the teen reading rooms are organized in conjunction with the kind of light that's being drawn through the central area. Next slide. So the two uh, primary facades, the two public facades are essentially marked by brick and we'll share some uh, rendering so you'll get a sense for the three dimensional quality of the project but they're also distinguished on the Austin Street side by a very large 29 foot high by 22 foot high uh, entry. So you'll see right into uh, the building. And then on 63rd, a uh, 20 by 22 foot high window, uh, in addition to a series of windows along the sidewalk. So we really want to kind of turn the building inside out. So you really start to see the kind of activities uh, as you both look in and look out. It's a, it is a party wall uh, condition. So um, on the south and on the west sides, um, there are adjacent buildings and surely as the neighborhood changes, these buildings will probably grow. This gives you a little bit of idea of the massing that uh, Mary and I talked about. Uh, even at the lowest level, we're bringing in natural light and through a series of stacked double height spaces, we hope to kind of provide a level of uh, 
I suppose, civicness and importance to being in this library. Next. So here you can start to see how the kind of pleating or the folding of the facade, both in plan and section, starts to bring in natural light, but also establishes a very strong presence, we hope, on the corner. And the texture of the neighborhood, as many of you know, it's fantastic kind of Queens, quintessential Queens, predominantly brick, very, very strong street line streets, uh, tree line streets, um, maples, uh, sycamores, uh, plane trees, uh, oaks. They really mark this as, a, I think, uh, again, uh, kind of a quintessential uh, intersection between the residential quality and the more commercial quality that you see in Queens. And then we're actually uh, going to be working with the Parks Department to uh, really select the right trees to amplify that tree-lined identity that Mike was talking about. And the green roof seed and will be non-irrigated and has been tested over time so that it can work that way. But what's interesting is as we start to think about the mineral language, the kind of masonry language of the community, and we also think about the, the copper details or even the kind of inspiration of the tree-lined streets, we've elected to work uh, on a, a green brick or uh, a kind of a glazed brick you can see, and you'll see a little bit later, real thing, an iron spot uh, that's been, uh, sorry, not an iron spot, but a wire cut so that when it's glazed, it has amplitude of texture. You can start color, to see yeah. the color and chroma then with a, a bullnose fin on the upper right that will begin to actually cast shadows and catch light uh, as it works around the building. And these are just samples. And you'll see the exact sample in uh, Katrin's uh, presentation of our, of our current scheme. But as we look at the the kind of strong corner entry, as Michael's described, the kind of civicness um, of this corner carries the bull-nosed uh, brick to kind of connect from both the entry to the major window. And you can see as it wraps around also the clear story up there to the children's reading room and the central entry. Most important in this view is to see that that brick makes its way inside. So that indoor-outdoor relationship uh, and that liminal space and in the interior staircase is one where Katrin's work is going to be uh, very important. Next slide. And then this is the view where we're looking from the south and you can also see the clear story window uh, at the shearing point into the public area. And you're looking up obliquely into the children's reading room through the double height window into the adult reading room. Next. And then this is really setting up Katrin's uh, presentation. This is a precinct where she is um, exploring a very interesting narrative that has to do with uh, something that she will speak about, but really engages this identity uh, through the percent of the art program. Yeah, and just to contextualize this location, this is opposite the 29 foot high by 22 foot high window. So it'll be a very strong presence on the street, particularly uh, at night as well. So this is a staircase area as well. You're seeing uh, from the top of the stair, uh, the axial view. So I think, Katrin, this is, I think the next slide is yours. Your, your, your opportunity. Great. Hi. So Katrin, I can try the remote control or I can control for you. Let me see if I can, if I can control, uh, let's see. That's me, I believe. Yes. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation uh, of my artwork for the New Regal Park Library with the, uh, for you. Uh, so I'm going to begin by just showing you very quickly a few images of my work. Uh, first is an image uh, from an exhibition in uh, Long Island City in Queens at Sculpture Center uh, from 2014. Um, uh, my studio has been in Queens since 2006, and uh, I will not have time to really talk about the works, but just to give you a quick overview. Um, in this work, I uh, handcasted uh, thousands of uh, concrete tiles and uh, designed this sort of faux uh, ornamental floor. Uh, and now I'm just going to continue <laughs> to the next slide, see if I can do that. Yes. Um, several of my recent works deal with um, sort of where I fit in as an artist in the cycle between nature and global trade of commodities. The work that I just, uh, I, I guess the slide uh, advanced on its own, or maybe I, I did that accidentally. 
in the artwork that I just uh, previously showed. It's, um, it was commissioned by the Sao Paulo Biennial for 2018. And I'm using paper and wood uh, from Brazil, materials that have been exported from Brazil and consumed in the United States and then recycled. And I, uh, I use them as recycled materials. Uh, this image um, is from 2019, and it's more sort of examining the economy around mining and material extraction. I am always interested in the story that is told by the material itself, and um, history is kind of a dimension in my uh, in my work, and uh, and it's going to be also in the work that I've designed uh, in the proposal for the for the library. Here is a work, uh, a detail of a work uh, that was commissioned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York in 2010, uh, where I interpreted two period rooms in the museum's um, collection. Uh, here is a work from 2015 uh, from the High Line. It's a, it's a maquette or a scale model of um, an island in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Um, my work often deals with memory and domesticity and the migrants experience as in, in this small work uh, from a series I made between 2005 and 2015, as well as in this series, um, which I started in 2017 and is still ongoing. The last artwork I wanted to show you is um, a work that I made during COVID, uh, which culminated in photographs that I made while excavating clay in Iceland. So it sort of relates a little bit to the work I showed earlier of the, of the small clay bricks. Uh, and I thought it would be appropriate to end this very short introduction of my work with a book. Uh, so now I am just going to go straight into my presentation. Here's um, just a, a slide from my uh, percentage for arts presentation. Um, from the very beginning, I have drawn influence for this artwork from the architectural design um, made by Weissman Freddy and, uh, and the elements that they present and that are already presenting in the building itself, such as the glazed uh, brick, surfaces um, and the green roof of the building. So my proposal for the library reflects on how we historically rely on plants uh, to make paper and from there uh, from paper to make books and also on how plants are visualized in print. Uh, so here's a slide showing um, the plants that I am considering for this artwork I've selected for my uh, artwork. And so my criteria for the selection of these plants is uh, these are plants that have been historically widely used for making paper. And they are also prevalent in Queens and or growable in Queens. And uh, as you see in this image, they are papyrus, flax, and paper mulberry. Here's a slide that, oops, now I need to go back. Sorry, I went one slide too far. How do I do that? Can I do that like this? Oh, here we go. Good. Um, this slide gives an overview of the different steps in the process of making the artwork. I will grow these uh, three species that I mentioned. I will then photograph them and use the photographs to create the composition for the mural in the library that I will speak about a little bit later. At the same time, I will harvest the plants that I have grown and I will photograph uh, that I have grown and photographed, and I will use them to make paper. So I will hand make uh, make paper by hand. Once they have been processed into paper, the images of the plants will be printed on the paper using a traditional half-tone process 
which renders the images as small dots. The paper is then found in a book or a small edition of books, and these, uh, this book or the, or, or the volume of books will become part of the library's holding. In this way, the mural artwork is illustrating and in a way commemorating the plant. The plant, which is the subject of the book, the plant, which is also the material of the book. And the book is then the holding of, in the holding of the library. And the artwork has these three aspects, the growing of plants, the making of a book, and the making of a mural. So here's a slide showing uh, the harvesting of flax and how flax is broken down into fiber and then uh, some steps in paper making process and bookbinding. And here's just a slide showing kind of um, um, a handmade book that I've made, how, how a book like this might um, look. So um, the artwork is located in the interior entry of the building and it will span approximately 1500 square feet over three walls as a continuous mural image. And you see here this um, green uh, outline, uh, which uh, kind of shows the area in the stairway, uh, which, I have, um, which I'm uh, going to be using for the artwork. Um, the artwork is in a space which is behind doors and windows, as we have talked about, but it still is a hybrid space, uh, which relates in a way very strongly to the outdoors uh, of the, the exterior area of the library, given that it's using the same um, surface. Uh, it has, it's using the same uh, ex uh, uh, glazed brick. And it is almost like an exterior space in that sense, uh, but it is, uh, you could say, sealed off by the glass, by windows and by uh, doors, which are also, and panels, which are glass. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the work is visible both from the exterior of the building and from the interior. And I envision that the work is going to be visible also uh, during, um, not during daylight hours, uh, meaning at night, that you're still going to be able to see the artwork from the exterior of the building, even when the library is not open and when it's not uh, lit, uh, when it's not light outside. Um, the artwork spans three levels of the building meaning uh, it is visible from all three levels of the building, uh, given that it's in the stairway and, and both from the interior and, and exterior, like I said uh, already. It's a space that is experienced by everyone that enters the building. Uh, and the artwork is visible uh, practically from the moment that you step in the building. It is on the wall that is uh, facing uh, to the back of the building when you when you enter, you see it kind of in the suggested you know uh, movement of people here through the building. And here again, you see uh, the location marked out in green. And uh, here again is the image that we looked at earlier. The artwork will receive uh, natural daylight from a, the east facing window that you see there. And uh, the daylight will uh, be an important factor in actually rendering the work because the work is, uh, is a sort of a mural relief. Uh, and we anticipate that there will be times when the artwork needs um, additional lighting and that's um, a discussion that uh, we have been having from, uh, from the beginning of uh, discussing this artwork. As I described earlier, the glazed brick will be used uh, to, uh, as sort of as a dot matrix to create a sort of rasterized image on the wall of the staircase. 
And here I am showing an image of a flax plant. This, you know, this would be then a plant that I had grown and I had photographed and I had sort of processed it um, into a composition for uh, the three walls in the hallway, in the stairway, sorry. And this next slide shows then um, a slightly more developed image where um, the three plants are, um, have been combined in, into a large combined image. Uh, and this is again, just a, a slightly different rendering of the same. And here you see uh, the south wall. This is the wall that then is facing the entry of the building. Uh, and, and the plant that you see mainly figured, uh, featured here is papyrus. And here you see the east wall. Uh, and here you see the paper mulberry. And here's the west wall where you see um, the flax. And so uh, these images are going to give a pretty accurate idea of, of what the artwork is going to look like. Uh, the anatomy of the plants is obviously anticipated anticipated to be exactly the same. By photographing them, by growing them and photographing them, I will have quite a bit of control over, um, you know, both how I photograph them and how I construct the, uh, the image that I will use. See. Um, so how will I use the brick to render the image? Uh, here you see again, um, images uh, from previously in the presentation. The extruded brick uh, that will be used to make these vertical stripes on the exterior of the building or the vertical relief on the exterior of the building is, um, is done with this brick where the uh, extrusion is sort of to the side of the brick. So in the way that the brick is laid up, uh, it um, kind of lays up in these straight vertical columns. Um, and then this is my uh, slight alteration of the brick. My objective is to use elements of, uh, use the element of structure that are already in place in the building's design and transform them into an artwork which becomes a systemic part of the building itself and harmonizes with it. In my design, I have shifted the extrusion to the center of the brick, which creates a, a staggered form uh, based on the uh, pattern that the brick is laid by when the brick is stacked up. And I will be taking advantage of the unglazed sides of the brick, uh, and that will create an additional color contrast in the artwork. So you see that what is shown in these images a sort of brown that is the exposed brick. And here are a couple of tests I made in my studio uh, with natural daylight conditions. This was on a very overcast day and uh, I was happy to see that the form still uh, produces the lighting effect that I'm uh, after. Uh, and this was on a day where the light was very soft and diffused. So I imagine on a sunny day, the light is going to be even crisper. Uh, so here are just a few renderings that are not necessarily uh, indicative of the detailed form of uh, the artwork or the detailed composition, but they are more to show um, my technique of form building for the artwork. So, uh, but what these renderings uh, show are the um, actual number of bricks that compose the walls in the hallway. So they give an accurate sense of the granularity of the form. The artwork is so as you can see, the artwork is both structurally and materially identical with any brick wall surface in the building. It is entirely going to be entirely out of reach. And it will, um, it will not, uh, this is like a, just a close up of the, of the brick. 
the artwork will not need um, It will not need any routine maintenance or cleaning. It can be dusted like any other wall surface in the building and it does tolerate water-based cleaning methods uh, perfectly. Although I don't anticipate that the artwork will need to be washed. It can be dusted with a general purpose duster on a telescopic handle with spray duster or a vacuum cleaner if necessary. And uh, here's just a repeat of an earlier image uh, where I wanted to end. And uh, thank you for uh, taking a look at this presentation. And I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. So Signe, we do not have anyone signed up to testify. I wanna take a moment to uh, make a public announcement that if you do, if you are watching, if you're here in the room, if you are watching on YouTube and you want to testify for any of the projects on today's public hearing agenda, please do sign in on the testimony form. The link for that is below the meeting. <clears throat> I'm sorry, below the video, the YouTube video. It's also in our agenda. Okay. Okay. Well, <clears throat> thank you to both uh, teams. That was a very enlightening presentation. Um, so uh, do commissioners have any questions either for the artists or for the architects? Yes, Ken. I just wanted to say thank you for great presentations from both. And uh, I really appreciate this form, both the artwork and the building. Uh, and I got kind of excited about it when I saw it. So that was really exciting. And then I thought like, um, it reminded me of enclosures around uh, uh, like Dozier's pyramid, like the Imhotep, the, the step pyramid, so that the exterior of the building had this uh, this patination so they work with the sunlight like the enclosures in, in Saqqara. And then that the artist had kind of picked up on that and then taken it another step forward. And then I slept on it after making comment on it. And I thought if there was some small way that there, the work that's on the inside could somehow be reflected to the outside, you would amplify it even more without having to do new materials. And it's just an opportunity. I'm not suggesting that you have to do it or anything, just it would be so exciting if you look on page like 37 of the, of the design, you'll see like 37, 36, you'll see there's that whole tree lineup that sort of corresponds with, uh, the, the pattern on the outside of the building. And so there's this kind of opportunity there. Uh, that's not it, but uh, yeah, yeah, this one, this is the one. And there's an opportunity to sort of create a mock tree on the exterior of the building. And I just thought that would be really fun and a really great sort of almost preamble to what could happen inside, which is more intense, but would allow, th this is just, I, I was very, I, I, I love the design and I think that they're all wonderful, but if there was a way that you guys could work together to do that, it would be such a phenomenal growth in this project. It would be, I would just, you know, I think people would really be excited and also would, would add the natural element of the building being part of the natural element on the exterior and then would grow on the interior is this surprise. But of course that's up to you guys. And of course it's, it's beautiful as it is and I just, I'm, I'm very happy about the marriage of how it is that this artist saw what you were doing, anticipated that and grew it. And now I think also it would, yeah, I just think it's great. So thank you, bye. <laughs> thank you, Ken. Hi, Hi it, it's Meryl. I have um, a question about the library use. I'm gonna leave it to all the artists on the committee to talk about the design and the marriage of the form. I wanna talk about the use of the building. In a lot of new library structures that run across my desk, I often see now spaces that are dedicated to technology rooms and spaces that are dedicated to teenage use. As these libraries have really transformed in very large extent into functioning community centers. And I'm wondering, as you've thought about this fantastic design, have you thought about multiple pers purpose rooms that can be used just to 
entice teenagers or families that need um, hook up to technology and so forth. Uh, we can unmute uh, Michael and Marion if you want to address that, or we can also ask DDC or QL to respond. Hold on one second, trying to unmute them. Um, are we unmuted? Yes. 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 That's, a, that's a great observation. And each of the floor levels does have access to uh, dedicated technology precincts. And it might be helpful, I think, for the Queens Public Library folks to speak to how that is not so much consolidated or isolated, but distributed and made as part of the fabric of the uh, experience of all three levels. I think Chantal Antoine is from Queen's Library. I mean her and then also Zia here. Grace, did you ask about Zia? Oh, Zia Daywood. I don't oh. see him here, but um, I think C. Antoine is somebody from Queen's Library. So yes, that's. And, and Jackie uh, Krasnikovskaya could also respond from, from our team, too, specifically. Hello. Well, okay. Good afternoon. Yes. Hi, this is Chantal. Can you hear me? Yes. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, in terms of, it, it is a great question. And one of the uh, uh, positives with this particular project is that the teen area does have the adjacency of the multipurpose room. Um, as well as the children's room on the upper floor. So those spaces are interconnected. We have, we provide computer areas in all of our reading rooms and most of our tables are powered. Um, the teens will be able to work together uh, and also have the access of the multipurpose room for larger um, cyber center needs and for the rest of the community at large. So technology is a huge aspect of the flexibility of our spaces. So we do take that into consideration and Weissman Freddie did serve um, that programming need that we do have. Thank you very um, much. Sorry, if I can just add quickly um, also to Chantal's point that on the cellar level next to the teen uh, reading area, we also have what we're calling a quiet room it's also been called a conference room, but um, the idea of that space is kind of a similar multi-purpose function. It does have um, a screen. And so the idea is that the community is also kind of welcome to use that space um, for various programming events or meetings. Um, I had a question. Um, I just wanted to say, I think it's a very beautiful project. And I think the marriage of the uh, artists together with the architects, it's, it's extremely successful. And I just wanted to ask, because now I'm hearing, you know, more about the artwork is, and, and the elaborate process for it. I was just thinking about it didactically and the fact that you're in a library and that you make these books that have all the information about the plants that you mentioned that you're growing. I mean, will that be available to the public? How will because when you look at the piece, you don't actually know that, obviously, but it's really super interesting to be able to have that information as well. So what are the plans for um, opening up the process of the project to public? Maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, I don't know. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, that's a very important aspect of the work. I, I would like the work to be, um, I would like the sort of the mural aspect of the work not to rely on being able to see the book, but I think that it's very important that the book be uh, available for people in the library. There is obviously going to be signage which uh, will explain the process, and um, and I I'd like to think about like how we flesh that out. Maybe you know. Um, certainly in public programming maybe, and also in um, if, the, if the book is, you know, part of the holding of the library, I do not see it as, um, 
you know, uh, I don't see it as something that is sort of kept behind um, closed doors. I, I'd like, uh, but, but that's also something that I think uh, that is a dimension of the project that I really would like to um, elaborate on and collaborate both with the, you know, both with the staff of the library and also um, with the with the architects on how how it's going to be how what's going to be the best way to do that. I mean, uh, I I think of of the library as a as an educational space, and there has always been an aspect in my um, in in this uh, art in this you know in this idea of of it having. Uh, the dimension to to teach people about this kind of relationship of, of materials to um, you know to kind of tr try to draw out the full circle of you know from nature over to the informational uh, space that we are in in the library. So I I hope that answers your question to some extent. But but. <clears throat> I would like to echo um, Laurie's point. Um, I've been a huge fan, Katrina, of your work, as you may remember, for a very long time. Um, and I think the genius here is both the use of the exterior of the building as one of your major building blocks, but the conceptual underpinning of sort of going from the organic of a plant to the digital imagery of the photograph and the docs matrix, and then back to the analog um, extruded brick is a conceptual genius, really. It's terrific. And I do think it needs to be explained because it's yeah. complex. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. And while the mural is extremely beautiful and can and should be enjoyed without any further explication, I think since this is a library um, and there are books and you're making both paper, printing and books, that there should be some um, way of showing people that there's access to this greater understanding of the conceptual basis for the work, either through some sort of plaque or a table or something Absolutely. that the um, library and the architects can work in a way that someone who's intrigued by what they see visually can understand the, the artistic thought um, that went into it, which uh, I think is terrific. I, I think both the building and this work and their integration, which we don't always see as really um, extraordinary. Thank you. Yeah, I, I feel that in the, you know, in the next development phase of this project, uh, I am going to address uh, in a very specific way how this is going to be made. I would, I would love it if there was a way, if, the, if for example, if this book is being made in a small edition or something like that, that there would be an actual um, tangible copy of the book somewhere in the library, so that you know you you approach the library and you uh, and this is also a little bit uh, addressing uh, the question from earlier or the comment from earlier about the indoor outdoor, and you you take in the beautiful form of the building from the exterior, and then you sort of as you kind of navigate into into the building. Uh, you're in this hybrid space and then you see kind of a different, um, uh, you see the, the elements of the building being interpreted in a different way. And then you kind of take yet another step and, and you are actually, you have a book in your hands and you can touch the paper and you can feel the granularity of the paper. And you know that what you're actually touching is being visualized in the building itself. I would like um, to just follow up that and just I say, you guys to... are already married and you should get more <laughs> married. You should get more married because it's going to work out for both of you if you do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go Commissioners, ahead. we do need to keep, we're right. really far behind. Okay. I, I, I have one thing really quickly. Um, yeah. but, um, perhaps, I, I think the project is really beautiful and I love the, the um, interest in organic elements within the bricks on the inside. Uh, I had just questions of maybe perhaps you could uh, 
in the future or get more um, information on the color of the inlaid brick? What, how brown is it? Is it more reddish brown or what, what sort of elements that is? Whether it is exposed brick, raw exposed brick, or if it's treated so that it's easier to clean or not clean or what, what that's gonna look like in terms of dust and collection. Um, I also had, because they're so beautifully um, curved out, what does the light source look like and where would there be extra light source and how would that um, reflect or not reflect or um, change the installation of the work, the overall work. Um, and I think that because of um, it is sort of mathematical and abstract and geometric that there's an opportunity to also sort of include some of these design elements or integrated somewhere else, like probably be underneath the, the staircase as well. So people can see it when they're coming up or maybe in the tile um, that you're walking on, maybe there's some sort of edge treatment when you're walking. But I think that there's, an there's many opportunities to sort of include um, these organic elements within the architecture. And perhaps that's a conversation you can have with the architects in terms of what other spaces you can probably introduce small elements. Um, I, I agree with uh, Phil and Kenseth that uh, it's an opportunity for education in terms of the process. Maybe uh, after you've gone through the process um, of figuring out the plants and all of that, you can have a, a sort of a key of yeah. um, just the actual plants and what plants you use and that those could be put on in sort of placard or tiles. Uh, in between bookshelves or on the floor, or I'm not sure where, but it's something that I think that is an important part of the process and it should be um, in, introduced in some way. Thank you. Yeah, um, so the color of the exposed brick, um, you know, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to make I'm trying to be very sort of economical in my own um, um, sort of um, interjection in the in the design and the actual structure. So I think that I will, you know, the color of uh, the color of the exposed brick is going to be the color of the structural brick and. Um, the structural brick that I have as a, as a sample copy is more or less the color that you see here. But that there is, um, you know, depending on what the, um, the factory that makes the brick is going to use specifically, uh, that's, that's going to be the color. Um, I imagine that I would, um, I would treat the, uh, the exposed sites with uh, an invisible sealant. You know, it's a sealant that you put on concrete that, you know, when I've used it, for example, for this large piece that I did for the Venice Biennial that I showed at the beginning um, um, that was shown at Sculpture Center. It's, you know, it looks like, it more or less looks like water, but it actually seals the brick from uh, water being able to penetrate into it. But otherwise, I would not. I, I think I would like to. Um, I would like people to have sort of an opportunity to almost see into the building by seeing the exposed brick, and um, and you know. And I I do think um, you know the piece gives the opportunity for for children to and adults to grow plants and to make paper. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very basic, wonderful process that I hope um, that might also be, you know, one of many ways in which um, the people who use the library can, um, can learn and, and kind of take part in the project of, of this artwork. Wonderful. Um, I, in the interest of time, I will uh, keep my mouth shut, but I just want to, uh, everyone to know that I completely concur with all of the positive statements that have been made. Um, can so I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can I just ask one quick question? I, yes. I know that we're behind, but I had a quick question about logistics, which is um, what was the rationale for putting the much more mobile teen group on the ground floor and um, having parents go all the way up to the third floor with children. 
Uh, can we unmute Queen's library again? Or Michael and Mary, if you know. Uh, yes, I, now I think we're, uh, we're not unmuted. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that. And I think that, uh, I think the folks from the Queens Library can really answer that most effectively. Um, but there, uh, there was a real distinction um, about uh, wanting that to be a, a dedicated precinct that was not on the main level, um, but had, uh, and Jackie, maybe you can elaborate. Yeah. Can Jackie be unmuted? Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would just like to clarify one thing. Uh, the adult level is actually the ground floor. The teen level is the cellar floor and the children's level is um, the second floor. So the idea is always that you're kind of one level off from the main zone. And uh, the, the decision to put the teens into the lowest level it did come directly from Queens Public Library. So I, I do think they should have um, respond directly, but I believe it has to do with just their experience of um, kind of placement of different groups on different levels in past projects. Hello. Yeah. My, uh, my question is less about where the teens are than about having you know parents with toddlers and strollers having to get into an elevator to go upstairs because I know when I used to use the Grand Army with my children it was very uh, easy to go in on the ground level and have the children's room be right there so you're not hauling your kids through the building and up uh, a flight of stairs or into an elevator to get to the children's area yep and yet you can run out the door <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, are there any further questions? I'm sorry to have cut you off. Um, okay. So we're going to take uh, a vote. This vote is going to be um, for each project. So when I call your name, if you'd please state your vote for each project as approve, reject, table, or abstain. So uh, one name, two votes. Phil. Approve for both. Uh, Ken Seth. Approve for both, please. Lori. Approve for both. Deborah. I'm seeing Deborah. Deborah didn't join yet. Oh, okay. Um, Karen. Approve for both. Uh, Manuel. Approve for both. Susan. Approve for both. Ethel. Approve for both. Meryl. Approve for both. Mary. Approve for both. And myself, approve for both. So that is unanimous. Congratulations to uh, both teams. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we will now take a, what? So we did have a break planned. Yes. But if members, uh, if members need a break, I think we can keep going. And then if you need to step out, you know, here and there, I think that's okay if everyone's in agreement. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we'll move forward then with the Queens Botanical Garden projects. All right. Um, so the next public hearing uh, is for item 27895, construction of an educational building at the Queens Botanical Garden and item 27896, the installation of an artwork at the garden. So uh, applicants will give a, again a combined presentation on both items and public testimony and both projects will be heard. And then the commission will uh, can ask questions, deliberate uh, and vote on each item separately. So um, please feel free. Uh, Carrie, do you, you wanna tee up the presentation? Yeah. So, um, Joan, I think you're muted and I've given you control. Uh, I think, am I not muted? Am I not muted now? Yeah, you're unmuted. We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, am I ready to jump in? Yeah, so I've given you control, the screen. So you're going to control for the architecture component and then we'll also unmute the landscape architects for that portion, but I'll keep the remote control with you. Okay, so, so I'm trying to move this 
forward. Let's see. Um, so I should be able to move it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, so I know you are, must all be somewhat exhausted. You've had a long day already, um, but here we are at the Queen's Botanical Garden, uh, the most culturally diverse county in the United States, I think still. And our site of the 39 acre garden is situated um, in um, the center of the screen. And we always like to think about the garden as being an extension of this greenway that runs through Queens, um, Flushing Meadows, Corona Park, the garden and Casino Park um, off to the right. Our site is at the southern end of the um, of the garden, and we'll be a little bit more explicit about that in the middle in a minute. These are just some quick views of it, but it is the only area in the site that has some topography, and you can see that on the left. On the left, there's a rise up to the residential area of Elder Avenue. Otherwise, the Queen's Garden is actually relatively flat, so you can see how uh, our building is mediating between a, a somewhat of a hillside. Again, one of the, the rare moments of the garden where there is some topography. The red outline um, shows where our building is located at the southern um, side of the garden. And this is just putting the context of the visitor administration building that was built uh, about 20 years ago, the maintenance building, um, the existing current education center, which will ultimately be removed and the working greenhouses. And also some of the more important garden areas. Um, we're right, our site is uh, immediately adjacent to the farm. Um, which is really important to our programming and directly across from the meadow, which is a large uh, festival and event space and directly across further from the parking garden, which is where uh, many folks will be arriving, particularly for special events and evening programming, but still quite visible um, along the Oak LA, which is the main entrance on uh, Main Street. Um, and again, we located this building here uh, after a pre-schematic, a, 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 pre-schematic um, exercise where we work very closely with the garden and DDC to understand how to serve the garden's needs best. And while this is an education building, like all the things that happen in the garden, it will have multiple functions. And one will be to almost serve as a secondary welcome area. So by locating the building at this southern side, it will serve a somewhat under-programmed and underserved portion of the garden now while being directly connected to the farm but there are a lot of public programs that happen in this meadow area and this uh, western side of the garden. And this building will allow them to come in, get information, um, use restrooms. So it serves not only uh, the education programming, which it's primary use, but also as a secondary welcome area while being quite visible across from the parking garden uh, directly across the way and easily accessible and visible uh, from the main entrance of the building. And these are showing the main paths of how people enter. And you will see when we talk about the scheme in particular, when our landscape um, team talks about the landscape, we're really trying to collect people off of um, the main paths and create an entry that is both welcoming um, an informal gathering place, a place to get information, a place to get to use restrooms. Um, our building is organized in uh, three parts. We have two bar buildings. One is the classroom building. The second is the office um, uh, building, which is two stories and has a public reception area, teaching kitchen and uh, meeting room on the ground floor, connected by this spine that runs through uh, the project. And by organizing the building um, in these three parts with the spine running through that, we're also creating uh, very important outdoor spaces. So uh, north facing public space that opens to uh, the public pathways as um, we saw in the plants before, and you'll see some more and then a more protected private outdoor classroom that allows the classroom programming to extend to a somewhat protected garden space that again, you'll see when we talk about the landscape serves as our major water management programming area. So that it has a kind of um, teaching uh, opportunity um, within these two uh, created public spaces. Uh, the spine connector is the organizing element of the building. It goes from a covered space, welcoming folks in to essentially a uh, uh, an extension of the classrooms and mediator between the classrooms and that private outdoor classroom space, culminating in uh, the solarium, which really is uh, like a greenhouse that connects to the programming of the farm and also the education programs within. And we also see the building almost as a path um, that it connects from the orchard to the, uh, to the east, um, bringing folks into the building through the covered 
area through the spine and directly linking to the farm so that our interest is the landscape essentially pulling through the building and so that the architecture weaves the garden programming um, and landscape into the building. Um, the, that the nature of the spine and whether it supports the classrooms or public or public programming depends what's happening at a given time of day. And you'll see can be opened and closed to have it be more private for a school group use or more public for public programming. Um, and so our plan, I'm, gonna, I'm going quickly because we have a lot to cover and hopefully when you ask questions, we can come back to any of these slides that you'd like. Um, this is our ground floor plan where you can see the classroom bar, uh, the upper portion of the plan. Um, this covered area is our entry plaza and Eric from um, OVS will speak um, much um, more specifically about the covered entry area. But one enters the building, if you're public, coming into a lobby, greeted by reception, if the building is open for public program, and one can slip right through into this covered spine and make your way outside. Uh, the spine wall is a fully glass wall that completely opens um, like a nano wall or a moving glass wall so that on uh, seasonally good days, there is a complete overlap between inside and outside of the spine to the outdoor teaching area. Um, there is also, so our four classrooms, staff workroom and solarium, which then one can continue out towards the farm. We also have public restrooms that serve the public and also ones that are directly connected to the outside. So one doesn't have to go inside to use the restroom. And another set of bathrooms that um, are located within the reception lobby area. This is a very public space for teaching kitchen that opens to the outdoor classroom. Uh, meeting space that can belong to staff or to um, the public. Oops, I just went the wrong way, I think. I'm sorry, wrong way. Second floor plan uh, is where the staff um, primarily resides and they have their own, I didn't show on the ground floor, but their own stair that brings them up. If they're uh, farm workers, they can, they can find their way directly um, up into um, the office area, which has very strong visual connections back to the garden with your own terrace that looks out um, over the orchard to the uh, east. And our roofs are all actively used. So on the, the two uh, classroom bar and the office bar, we have an array of um, PVs. And then the, the spine roof has an extensive green roof, which again, continues the idea of the landscape um, slipping through the building. Our materiality of the building is such that our two bars, the second, the two story um, portion on the back, which has a reception on the ground floor and offices above, and the classroom bar are stained dark wood with the intention that they recede, that this building is secondary to a landscape. And as the landscape goes up around the building, it almost is like a garden wall. Um, we're not trying to call attention to the building, but we are trying to highlight and make welcome the entry sequence. So the underside of the spine roof is a lighter wood. Um, that lifts and rises um, to signal wel welcome. And so that folks both know where, where to go to come in and it provides um, shade and protection um, from rain for some informal gathering and really serves as a welcoming um, invitation to come into the building. And also a visual linkage of the East and West as we can connect the orchard and the garden landscapes um, on the uh, East to the farm on the West. Uh, this is a view, and the, the, um, the dark stained wool is articulated by um, vertical fins, and the idea is to, to really highlight both the linearity of the building, so it feels like, these, um, like this garden wall that stretches through the garden, but the tree-like verticality rhythm kind of gives it, a, a, again, a, a more natural rhythm as it, it does its, um, its um, as it sits in its elongated presence along the edge of the garden. And you can see on the second floor, there's a staff terrace where staff can both step outside, see what's going on in the garden um, and um, have their own sense of um, a place to be outside even though they're on the second level. Uh, this is a view um, looking from um, the, the west side of the building where we're looking back underneath the covered roof. And you can see again, the lighter tonality of the wood uh, this wood will probably keep much of its warm tone because it's primarily protected. So we're interested in the kind of the natural wood color being, again, a signal of entry, of welcome. And you can see the terrace, um, the staff terrace up above and the community meeting space at the lower level. And this is looking uh, towards the solarium, which essentially 
wraps um, around the backside of the building and is visible from the farm side um, with direct access from the farm into the solarium, but also um, a protected vestibule entrance that can bring um, uh, visitors and kids if they're doing work in the farm directly back into our spine and the staff uh, meeting the staff workroom here with their own direct access outside. Uh, this is the view from the south and the, the taller back of the office building uh, is a hard view to get because there's a fair amount of uh, tree coverage on that hill, but the, the long open uh, glazed wall of the spine is intended to be a very open connection to the outdoor teaching area, which, as I said earlier, and Eric will speak about more, um, is the primary aspect of our water management scheme and a place where uh, kids, students, adults can engage with uh, best practices of water management, but also a landscape that's quite different from the ones they experience in other places uh, in the garden and a place for gathering and teaching. And you can see the, the solarium on the left, um, which is sort of the culmination of the spine as it makes its way um, uh, towards the Western exposure. The green, the roof kind of folds almost like a bow tie, it lifts up again, welcoming um, from the front side and welcoming at the, um, at the solarium edge so that it's always sort of lifting um, to beckon people uh, inside the building. Um, a quick section that shows how we meet the ground um, and our, our roof, which has an extensive green roof and quite a lot of insulation, um, but we're working very hard to keep a very thin edge um, so that it feels somewhat lighter than it is. Um, you can see the solar panels and we have some um, natural ventilation in the classrooms that rise above the, we have some uh, ventilating skylights that allow us to get cross ventilation. Um, and again, a bit about materiality, we're planning on using um, wood siding. We're very concerned about uh, durability over time. And we're working with a material, uh, a coya, which is um, a process that basically takes, um, it's an acetylation project. It's almost like soaking wood in vinegar um, in a simplistic way of saying it. It turns uh, any softwood into a hardwood so that the wood cannot absorb water. Uh, it has very low environmental impact. Um, it's recyclable, it has low CO2 emissions, and it has a 50 year warranty. We just finished using it up in Minwaska State Park Preserve and it's proving to be quite durable. Um, and we're using a combination of a dark um, stained wood to allow the building to again recede, but a lighter wood uh, where it's protected and will keep some of its uh, warm tone for the underside of the roof, which will actually be a hemlock that's a different wood, but will have a similar coloration to the portions of the building within the carb up above that are uh, also in a coya, but stained uh, a lighter color. And I'm gonna turn it now over to Eric Roth. Um, from Own Van Sweden, who are a landscape consultant, um, to say that we've really developed the landscape very much integrated into the architecture of the building, and then the art integrated into the landscape of the building. And we see the project as a really unified scheme and are very interested in the quality of the outdoor classroom space as really a teaching and habitable space that's programmable in multiple ways, as well as the front plaza. Uh, thank you, Joan. Can everybody hear me? Very good, thank you. you. Yep. I'm, I'm uh, Eric Groft, principal at UMA Van Sweden Landscape Architects, and we're happy to be uh, working on this project in, at Queen's Botanical Garden. And just following up on what Joan uh, said, there, we wanted to have a, a easy transition from other garden uh, pathways to this area. A primary, of, of course, was entrance to this building, uh, and we wanted it to be a very flexible space uh, uh, there are three steps up in the main, um, uh, the, the main approach to the main entrance, and there is also a sloped uh, walkway uh, that will facilitate uh, for people that don't uh, want to use steps. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, this is just showing uh, uh, pedestrian circulation either through the building from the existing farm to the teaching kitchen. Uh, or uh, there is an option to go outside uh, along the uh, 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 raised uh, a, a wood deck uh, in that area. Next. And this is uh, showing the um, spaces at the front, uh, uh, front plaza. Uh, there's a lower plaza that can accommodate 80. 
There's an upper plaza uh, that is mostly under the roof that can accommodate 140, as well as borrowing the space to the east uh, where, where there is a lawn that can accommodate 170. So uh, whether we, you have a small group or a large group, uh, the spaces kind of flow together. Uh, next. Uh, speaking to materiality, the um, paved uh, areas would be a cast stone uh, product. Uh, and then um, uh, just the uh, planting, uh, sort of following with the um, uh, orchard concept that is to the east, uh, we would be planting trees along the main pathways in a grid. Uh, similar to the uh, uh, nearby orchard. Uh, next. This is a rendering with the building and the trees along the main pedestrian uh, corridor. And you see the three steps up uh, from the lower plaza to the upper plaza, and then the sloped walkway off to the right, which aligns uh, with the front door and the accessible uh, bathrooms uh, in the building. Next, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the rear of the building facing the slope, uh, we're taking advantage of um, the slope to kind of give a sense of intimacy. It also is the natural place to have uh, stormwater management using stormwater management as an instruction, uh, possible uh, uh, education uh, function in this space. Uh, and again, having adaptable spaces that can accommodate uh, uh, different activities or one uh, large activity um, up to 165 people uh, in, in the rear. Um, uh, next. Uh, speaking to the materiality, this would be, uh, mainly be a raised uh, boardwalk uh, in this area that kind of hovers over the, um, the uh, stormwater management areas. But again, emphasizing the opportunities like in the lower right-hand corner uh, for uh, particularly children to, um, uh, to look at um, the stormwater management as an instruction tool. And just a rendering uh, of that space. Next, looking from the slope at the uh, at the building, the uh, farm would be to your uh, to your left. Next, uh, showing the um, tree placement. As I had mentioned earlier, the um, uh, grid like patterning of the trees that uh, follow the um, orchard and then having a scrim of smaller trees along the main pedestrian path, and then trees that can accommodate the, uh, uh, the wet conditions and the stormwater management area in, in, the, in the rear. Uh, the materiality of wherever we, uh, we're gonna use gabion, uh, gabion walls, uh, wherever, we need, um, uh, wherever we need to uh, have some retaining. Next. Our palette for the uh, various areas, uh, the area along the main pedestrian uh, path and the classrooms, uh, we're uh, choosing plants that will attract uh, pollinators. Uh, and uh, we have the, uh, just a suggested palette for each of these areas for the orchard or bosque area the rain garden, um, stormwater management area in the back. And then also we'd like to have some understory uh, trees suggested for the uh, adjacent hillside. Next. Uh, in the area, uh, the, also a stormwater management area uh, to the west adjacent to the farm, uh, either uh, a blueberry or aronia uh, in that area. Next. And then the uh, various um, ground plane uh, uh, plants as well. Uh, we're we're going to keep this uh, very simple. Uh, these are fairly limited areas, so we can't have everybody's favorite plants. 
uh, but they're going to be well selected uh, to reinforce the educational aspect um, of this of this building. More of the palette. Next. I think that's our last one. And that's our last one. Is that right? Oh, okay. There are, I think there are a few more, but we can jump ahead to the art I think now. Um, so now I'm going to give um, William control. Great. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to make sure this will move. Huh, the arrows are not working. Arrows. Okay, they are. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, to present this project. It's been a real pleasure working with the architects who just presented, and I'm thrilled about this project. Before I get into the specifics of the proposal, I wanted to give you a bit of background about my work and my practice and kind of how I've approached this project. Um, for the last 10 years, I've made work that ranges from sculpture to installation, working with natural systems and living systems like this 2019 project for Socrates Sculpture Park. Um, and working with entirely non-living systems using fans and pumps and timers to create the conditions for this rapid crystalline growth in the gallery um, to working on location and in a kind of interventionist methodology, kind of cutting into this, this old concrete slab. And in all of these different kinds of work, I think the underlying interest I have is in the forces that animate the natural world and the way that artwork can uh, push up against that and the way that I as a performer can, can engage with them or through creating sculptures that, that can uh, interact with those, uh, these forces. This is a project from uh, a kind of performative project in the Atacama Desert where I tried to kind of activate the dormant seeds by kind of walking back and forth with this irrigation device um, and I highlight this just because this performativity is really important to the way I think about artwork, and it, it is also important to this proposal. Um, and when not part of the work itself physically, you know, I think about materials that can be sensitized in some way. Um, this is a project I did for Storm, uh, for Storm King Art Center where the glazing was made of uh, caramel and it kind of changed over the course of the, the installation. Um, so the two main ideas, the two questions I had after visiting the botanical gardens was how can I make an artwork that acknowledges the incredible complexity with which water is used uh, on this site and how can this artwork be something that can give viewers a uh, palpable and tangible experience with um, a, a hydraulic system. And the, so I want to start by just reading um, a kind of abbreviated statement because it gets at a lot of the things that are important with hopefully less time. Um, Water Offering is a public art installation composed of two large stone sculptures located adjacent to the Queens Botanical Gardens New Education Building. I've designed Water Offering so that viewers can directly engage with the artwork, pouring water into carved basins and watching it move through channels eventually running over an unfinished rock surface, revealing its mountainous topography. Made of quarried granite and glacial erratic boulders, these pieces reference both the massive infrastructure built to support the inhabitants of New York City and the largely invisible system of aquifers and groundwater reservoirs, both of which are used to irrigate the plants in this garden. This two-part sculpture continues the diagonal axis of the education building, connecting the building site back to the garden. As performative works, these pieces can be activated by individuals on their own or by the institution as part of its mission to educate visitors. The effort required by visitors and staff to activate this work is an important part of its meaning. As participatory works, rather than constantly running fountains, we are immediately aware of the materiality and scarcity of water. I hope that through this work, we can become re-enchanted with its elemental properties uh, of water and give greater consideration to our relationship with it. Uh, continuing in that thought process, I thought I'd speak a little bit more to the two-part nature of this piece. Uh, one of the main desires I had in, in making this uh, a kind of multi-part work was to create a bridge between the built environment of the new education building and the garden itself. 
So the first piece actually spans the upper terrace um, and kind of and kind of spills over into the garden and then connects that visual line. The, the other kind of larger context that I want this work to acknowledge is this massive New York City um, watershed and water supply that the garden um, and all of us are kind of beneficiaries, whether um, we reflect on it very often. And then finally, um, the context I hope that this, this piece can acknowledge is the geologic history of this site as it, as it sits right on the edge of this glacial moraine that you know, 12,000 years ago receded uh, this massive ice shelf and left behind these interesting kind of geologic features. These are a couple glacial erratic boulders um, that are still visible in, at Orchard Beach. And I hope that that history can become part of the work through the choice of materials. So I'm, I'm using a type of boulder um, called field stones that are essentially glacial erratics that are found in fields. And then on the right, um, some kind of quarried, um, a rough hewn quarried rock, um, whether it's granite or limestone, I'm still kind of investigating um, different quarries uh, that, that speaks to the kind of built landscape in, in New York. Um, again, to talk a little bit about the experience for viewers, this, this diagonal access um, that continues the line of the building back to the garden, that is primarily um, the first type of experience that a viewer would have with this, which is of course visual. Any viewer who is um, on this upper terrace can kind of either walk out of the building or walk around this uh, platform and kind of look down this sculpture and into the landscape, they will see this other part. Um, these, these artworks are intended to be really integrated into the ground where the, they are actually kind of, the, the lower piece is actually kind of coming up out of the grass. And in that way, it, um, it kind of, it continues the sense that these artworks are almost part of the landscape, but upon closer examination are, are in fact, something that you can touch, which is the second major element that I want viewers, uh, all viewers to be able to experience, which is the tactility of the work. And this starts from, uh, or this is accessible to all viewers on the upper plaza, both touching the basins, the channels, um, and the exterior surface of the rock, which I hope gives them the impression that this is actually a piece that can be performed, um, which is the final element of, of the way a work can be experienced pouring water into the basins, watching it run down the channels and then exit over the unfinished um, kind of mountainous uh, raw surface. The last thing uh, I will say about this is that the two pieces are in some ways, the carved parts are in some ways inverses of each other. The first has two basins that, that kind of run together and then out onto this unfinished rock. And the second carved piece is a single basin with two exits, um, because I, I really like the idea of, of this kind of single kind of vessel, a single cup of water, water bottle, kind of being divided and having this experience of kind of simultaneously watching water move in opposite directions. Um, the maintenance for this piece should be relatively minimal given that the rocks are quite hard and using you know, a mix of warm water and, um, and soap, uh, and a plastic brush, if necessary, can clear any kind of material residue or, or organic material that collects in the rock. Um, a few examples of the stones that I've been looking at. On the left is a, is a cut field stone that's been kind of polished, I think, to 200 grit there. Uh, and on the right is a uh, limestone slab that I'm imagining for the base of the second piece. Uh, some of the sculptural language that I've been thinking about comes from the geology that I've been looking at. Um, this is a shale block and these kind of subtle changes in elevation is something I like um, that allows the water to have, to have a, a, a kind of energy to move and the natural forming kettles that you'll see in, in kind of river stones. Finally, I think the thing I really wanna stress is the experience, not necessarily of watching water move through a cut channel because we, know where it's going, the, the cut marks show that. Um, but it's really the, the kind of way that this piece opens up and the way water can kind of move over an unfinished surface where you know, watching that bead is essentially like watching this drawing, this kind of elegant movement of, its, of the kind of effortless way that water finds its way 
over a piece of um, hard stone, changing its color and making this kind of wonderful temporary drawing. To me, that moment of discovery is like really important. Um, and I think it's something that, that can be accessible for, for kind of this really wide um, age range. Um, lastly, a few more material tests that I've shown. This is actually a rock that's at the garden, which remarkably is, is kind of amazing in and of itself. Um, and a few more cuts that I've been making just to test out kind of how, um, how to kind of construct this piece. Though I will not be making this myself, this is something I'm gonna kind of be working with fabricators. It's really important that I have um, a kind of good material sense before I begin kind of handing some of the actual carving off to somebody else. Um, and that is it. And I welcome all of your feedback and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you to both teams. Um, <clears throat> Carrie, do we have any uh, public testimony? No, we do not. All right. Um, commissioners, over to us. Uh, comments, questions? Uh, we can take the building first. We can take the artwork first. Mary, uh, so you're in yeah, I have a quick question in terms of um, the carving or the inlaid design that you have on the boulders. Um, can you, is there, do you have any finals on that or are, do you have variations of that? Or, and is there something that you wanted to add in terms of inspiration of the, those, whatever design you do have uh, imprinted on, on um, how the water will run and uh, why those designs specifically? Um, I, I would like, I would want to hear something about that, but also if you, if you in the future have more than one possibility, maybe we could see that. Uh, you're muted. Did we ask to unmute? Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for that question. There are variations, and I, I think one of the challenges I've been facing is just getting um, realistic bids back from contractors. And so I've been kind of maintaining a, a slightly, um, I've been maintaining kind of one or two designs that I've been kind of shopping out because I'm, I'm afraid that their delays, and that there's really only a few fabricators that can work with large stones and make this kind of, uh, these kind of cuts and handle this kind of material. And their, their slowness has kind of put me in this position where I can't just keep iterating on the design um, and expect to know the, the kind of costs. They are finally getting back to me now after, you know, you know, longer than I'd like, but absolutely there will be iterative designs. This is a kind of early conceptual phase and you know you will see kind of a probably a few variations in the next phase. Um, so my so follow up question would be like, what what sort of inspiration are you gathering to create these um, designs? Are they wholly abstract? Are they inspired by architecture, ancient architecture, yeah. or you know textile? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know they are basically coming from a mix of looking at rocks in the landscape for those kind of kettle-like forms, and then thinking about the contrasting elements of this kind of grid-like system of New York City's um, uh, water supply, which is you know, not organic. It is kind of a series of lines and, and kind of rectilinear things. So this piece is, I'm thinking about it coming from both of these types of mark making from this kind of much more organic, glacial receding kind of carvings of kettle forms and, and the kind of direct linear cuts of a machine saw and this kind of direct carving. Um, th those have been my thinking. I included these references to other two kind of offering tables and megaliths as examples of this kind of hydraulically graded um, type of sculpture that can be performed, not to use those as kind of representationally um, inspiring. Uh, the one last thing I would like to say is that if, if time is an issue or manufacturing of it, maybe you can consider speaking to the, um, uh, I guess the people who are going to be creating the, the grooves in the, and see if there's another element in terms of maybe something that could be inlaid that would make your design mm -hmm. more your design and not limited by their ability to move yeah. um, that such such a large boulder. So perhaps like an inlaid piece that could go within the boulder itself. Mm. That way, 
you wouldn't be limited to your actual artistic design of the lines and the geometry that you're choosing. Thank you for that suggestion. <clears throat> Any other uh, comments or questions? Um, I, I guess I do have a question, uh, Joan. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation and your excellent architecture as always, particularly uh, sensitive to sight and, uh, and nature. Um, I guess I have a question um, about how many more buildings the Queens Botanic Garden plans to build? Um, yeah, Susan, um, or I, I can answer that based on the master plan we did, or Susan or Gennady, do you want to take that question? Um, why, um, I don't know whether Gennady is muted. Um, I can't see oh, him. Oh, Gennady, but, yes, I see. Yep. Um, I'm happy to answer it, but do you want me to take it, Gennady, or do you want to do it? I'll, I'll do it. Um, you, um, can, so, you can get us started if you want me to add anything else. So. Okay, we did it. We did an updated master plan just internally for the garden to kind of look at some planning kind of goals. And I think that um, my understanding is that the greens that the, at some point the greenhouses that are there will be rebuilt, that the existing education building will be removed, and there may be a large kind of protected pavilion at the probably more towards the um, western end of the site for just informal gatherings. But I think programmatically, there are not a lot of buildings that are anticipated functionally for the garden. We're sort of taking care of between the visitor administration building, this building, the offices needs are met. We're, we're housing um, folks from the composting and farming program in this building. We've been planning for storage needs there. So I think that other than perhaps um, new greenhouses to replace the existing greenhouses, and perhaps a covered pavilion type structure um, for more just outdoor programming. There are not other buildings anticipated that I'm aware of. Okay, thanks very much. Um, any other comments or questions, commissioners? We're going to, if not, um, then uh, what we're gonna do is what we did for the uh, prior presentation, which is to ask for you to uh, approve, reject, abstain, or table. Um, uh, each project, but we're going to take one roll call and you'll uh, give me uh, your vote for uh, each project. Uh, so that said, um, Phil. Approved both. Ken said. Both, please. Uh, Lori's just uh, left. Uh, Deborah, has she joined? No. No. Um, Karen. Approve both. Okay. Manuel? Approve both. Susan? Approve both. Thank you. Ethel? Approve both. Uh, Meryl? Approve both. Mary? Approve both. And myself approve both. So uh, you have a, a unanimous uh, a vote uh, for both projects in favor. Congratulations to both teams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, moving along. The next uh, public hearing item is number 27897, Installation of Reflections by Oasa Duverni at the Eastern Public Library. Uh, per standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony will be heard, and then the commission will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. So, uh, Carrie, you can kick us off. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate that if you're in the meeting or watching on YouTube and you want to give public testimony, please do sign in using the sign in form. And the link to that form is on the agenda and it's also in the description below the video. Okay, Grace. Okay, Orisa, uh, I believe I've given you control. And you're unmuted, so start when you're ready. Great, thank you. All right, just testing it to make sure it works. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm very excited to be here uh, for the Eastern Parkway Library conceptual design presentation. Um, my name is Oasa Duvernay, and 
We're gonna look at some of my previous artworks. I really like to make drawings. Drawings that assert the existence of black and brown people in the past, present, and future. Drawings that resist the exploitation of our bodies and our erasure from the accepted historic narrative. The figure on the right, a child, my child, standing statuesque, is veiled and flanked by black power waves that frame the embodiment of the often ignored innocence of black children. These waves are activated as a protective layer, each side mirroring the other, directing the gaze back and forward, asserting its presence. These black power waves are a symbolic motif that articulates the necessity of our collective liberation that can only come through black liberation. Liberation expressed as waves of water speaks to the many ways that movements simulate a massive wave, at times condensed and accumulating, and when the time is right, dispersing, flowing through different channels, carrying new ideas. Which brings me to the Brooklyn High Art Machine. The Brooklyn High Art Machine is a collaborative public art project that I do with a fellow artist and neighbor, Mildred Beltry. Mildred and I have lived in the same building in Crown Heights, Brooklyn for the last 22 years and have been making art with our neighbors for the last 11. Over the years, this has looked like many things, including weaving messages to our neighbors into the fence of a bridge on our block. Through this process, we have learned that being outside and engaging in art making as black and brown people is to resist the criminalization of our bodies in public spaces. Being an artist in community, I have learned that being outside together can make a sidewalk a creative and generative space for everyone. That our neighbors look forward to walking down the block before and after a long day to reflect. And that time for reflection is a type of kindness we don't often afford each other in this city, but bright, bold words require that pause we don't usually give ourselves. Project site, um, Eastern Parkway Library, major renovations. Here's the borough map of Brooklyn. Here's our library location in Crown Heights. Again, uh, our library location in the neighborhood. This is a current exterior uh, site photo. More photos for surrounding context. Exist this is our existing site plan. This is the site plan with the new addition. Reflections artwork proposal. In the spirit of creating space for reflection and contemplation for the Brooklyn Public Library Eastern Parkway branch, I'm proposing a series of reflective portraits that honor authors of the African diaspora that also have roots in New York City. The portraits will be framed by black power wave motifs and plant life. Plant images will include both native and non-native plant species from the, numerous, from the numerous regions of the African diaspora, grounding the portraits in a narrative of migration and history. Focusing on the African diaspora pays homage to the diversity of cultures and peoples of African descent currently living in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, their journey in making this community home. Here are two conceptual drawings using the authors, Audre Lorde and James Baldwin. I'm proposing to make these artworks from mirrored materials such as shatterproof glass and or metal in a variety of jewel tone colors. Here's a rendering indicating with red dotted line where the artworks will live on the mezzanine level outside of the team zone of the library. In this site plan of the mezzanine level with the bright purple lines um, indicating the proposed location of the artworks. This is the artwork location plan with scaled measurements. This is the proposed lighting and artwork installation plan showing angled degrees that artwork will be hung to invite viewers to see their own reflection in the artwork. 
community engagement. It was a three-step plan, which began with uh, BPL librarians nominating authors from the African diaspora for the portraits to, uh, for the portraits uh, to create a long list of 15 authors, which was followed by an engagement with the team program participants who reviewed authors' profiles created on an online platform called Millinote to select the top 10. And finally, selection opened up to the general public via social media to help select the final eight authors, who are Edgewood Danticant, Claude McKay, Tom Fillings, Claudia Jones, Lucille Clifton, Shirley Chisholm, Paul Marshall, and Gloria Naylor. Here's an example of an author profile created on Millinote using Audre Lord. This is a screenshot of the event information page for our community engagement with BPL teams. And here we have a portrait diagram. Please note that this is a placeholder and not a final design. Each of the final eight artworks will be composed with a portrait of one of the selected authors in the center and framed by Black Power Wave and plant life motifs. <clears throat> the artworks will measure no more than six feet in length or width. Here's a portrait diagram showing how plant life and wave motifs may be used to frame the portraits. Uh, please note that there is an example, there will be an example of current plant life, native plant life, um, and plant life from the African diaspora in each portrait, um, along with the black power waves and of course the portraits. Here's, um, <clears throat> sorry, here is the, here's the diagram and to the right you'll notice that there are some proposed colorways for the mirrored glass. These are research drawing, drawings and color renderings of current local plant life that, it, that is um, at the Eastern Parkway Library. These are research drawings and color renderings of native plant life, specifically orchids that are native to Brooklyn. And these are drawings and color renderings of plant life uh, from the African diaspora. These are drawings of <clears throat> black power waves that will be used to make uh, the motifs for the portrait frames. And here we have examples of materials and colors I'm researching for the eight artworks, including shatterproof mirrored glass and mirror, mirrored polished stainless steel. I'm also considering laser etching for the portraits and metal casting for creating the motifs. Cleaning and maintaining shatterproof glass requires the use of lint-free cl cloths and a simple mixture of liquid detergent and warm water. Cleaning and maintaining stainless steel requires a foam spray cleaner and a dry cloth. This is a rendering of the mezzanine with the artwork locations indicated with the portrait diagram. And here we have an additional perspective. Um, thank you to all of the commissioners and everyone else in attendance. Um, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, apologies for mispronouncing your name. It happens to me all the time as well. Um, do we have any, um, uh, any public testimony, Carrie? Uh, no, ma'am, we do not. All righty. Um, so would any commissioners like to uh, ask questions, comment? Um, yes, uh, I also this, um, just wanted to say that I'm really excited about your project. I look forward to, uh, I guess, the final renderings of the selected artists. Um, I also had a question in terms of the reflective qualities of the actual finished piece and the combinations of the materials. Um, perhaps uh, a further study in terms of what that would look like next to each other, if it's metal versus glass and, you know, how reflective each one of those in combination would look in terms of what, in, um, in combination with the actual architecture lighting, what that would look like would be helpful. Um, and also the final color ways or the decisions on that. Right. Uh, yes, it would seem that I thought I think your the notion of uh, tilting the piece 
so that one is reflected within it. Um, testing the the glass versus the the metal, I, I think, is going to be pretty telling there. And um, uh, Phil, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? No, or, no. It just Ken Seth, do you want to say anything? Anyways, I love it. I just love it. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say that I love it. And I wish there could be more of it, more. But that's not really criticism or a question, but thank you. Well, it's wonderful to hear. I love Ken's enthusiasm. I, you're my neighbor, so I'm so just so glad you're making something in our neighborhood. So thank you, thank you. I did have a question about the placards. Would they have a similar, are they just gonna be solid um, metallic color or are they gonna have like in, any sort of text or information about um, the people who are there, who are selected? Um, so is there, is, is there a separate placard for each and it, will they have the same sort of treatment or is it just gonna be a straight you know, metallic placard? Or do you know? That's a really great question. Um, and I will explore both options um, and to see what, what works best with the artworks. Um, all right, well, if there are no further comments or questions, let us uh, proceed to take a vote. Uh, this is a, a roll call vote on item 27897. So when I call your uh, name commissioners, Please state your vote for approve, reject, table, or abstain. Phil. Approve. Ken Seth. Approve. Laurie's gone. Deborah's not here. Karen. Approve. Manuel. Approve. Susan. Approve. Ethel. Oh. Ethel is muted. Sorry. Okay. Approve. Ethel, thank Approve. you. Thank yes. you. Meryl. Approve. Approve. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. Approve. And myself approve. Uh, well, excellent. Uh, we have uh, unanimous approval. And thank you very much to the team. And OASA. <laughs> and um, now we are moving on. Uh, our final public hearing item is for, you'll be thrilled to know, um, is 27898 installation. Oh, I'm going to butcher this one. Emanative by Ito Otigbe. Please correct me. Um, at the Harlem River Greenway Esplanade. Uh, so we will, we will have the um, applicants give their presentation. If there's any public testimony, we will hear it. And then we will... Uh, commissioners will deliberate uh, and vote. So, uh, good afternoon, commissioners and attendees. I'm Gail Rothstein from EDC. We're here today to present the conceptual artwork proposal for the Manhattan Greenway Harlem River project that just received your preliminary approval. The artist is Edo Odetigli and the artwork is called Imaginative. Just a note before we begin, uh, the presentation includes some lighting detail options that we just reviewed maintaining agencies and have since been determined to be infeasible. So we won't be speaking to those today, but we'll continue to explore lighting solutions and we'll come back to you with those designs in the future. Edo? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eto Otetigbe. I'll be speaking about the Emanative Project. Um, thank you for taking time to um, for me to share this project with you this afternoon, and I really want to congratulate the artists who went before me with some really stunning presentations. I'm really excited. Um, as uh, today, New York City is still recovering from Hurricane Ida. There's been loss of life, damage to homes, and our infrastructure has been damaged as well. So uh, as we think about rising sea levels and climate change, as a city, we're wondering, how are we going to protect ourselves? Is it even possible? Uh, the site for my project is in one of these critical locations. It's along the Harlem River Greenway. And um, the history of Harlem, the culture of Harlem, but also these current critical issues inspired me 
to create this design, something that could respond to the environment, something that could echo the community and the history of um, people in Harlem and their cultural traditions. I was really interested in finding a way to transform wave energy into cultural activity. And that's how my proposal developed. Um, a couple other goals I had was to create a space for contemplation and also an object that could be activated uh, for different activities. I also wanted to um, call it our attention to the ecology of the area, of the site, the fact that the Harlem River is an estuary where different bodies of water meet. So I, I think that that's a metaphor that's really appropriate in a lot of ways um, about people getting together, about things transforming, about this push and pull and tension. Um, so I believe I've given you um, control of the screen if you wanna advance any of your slides. Great, Let me, okay, there we go, yep. Uh, so just as uh, just for your information, um, I'm mainly going to talk about some changes to the proposal. There has been a preliminary presentation, so I'm not going too much into my background. But if you have questions, I can go over that during the Q and A. Um, this is the site of the Harlem River Greenway project. It's quite an expensive site um, with a lot of different um, activities and uh, things planned so that it could be uh, a multi-use site. You enter the park right here around 127th Street. Um, and if you walk up north about 1500, 1600 meters, you come up to this area called the Harlem Grove. The emanative sculpture will be situated around the southernmost point of the Harlem Grove. Previously, I had a concept of these four towers and a wave canopy, and also this raised stone platform. The platform would serve to be a sort of stage for performers when the site is activated. Um, just uh, for folks who may not be familiar with the concept, what's happening with the sculpture is within each of these towers made out of stainless steel uh, are embedded organ pipes, actual musical organ pipes. Those organ pipes are connected to other pipes that run through the base of the Greenway out into the Harlem River. When changes in water level that correspond with the tides or even a boat passing by, or perhaps the water is more turbulent on one day or another, changes in water level will cause air pressure to move through those subground pipes and up and out through the organ pipes, thus creating sound. Um, the towers will be based on a dominant seventh chord, which is uh, a series of notes, a cluster of notes that has roots and associations with um, free jazz, with bebop, with gospel as well, all musical traditions that have a firm root uh, in Harlem. The proposal I'm sharing with you today is showing a revision to that earlier concept in the sense that I'm interested in removing the platform. I think there were quite a few accessibility issues that came into play with having a raised stone platform. And by eliminating it, um, it allows the site to be more inclusive and more open and more inviting for an interactive experience. Um, in place of the raised platform, there will be granite pavers that echo the design of the wave canopy. So if you took that wave canopy and you essentially stretched it out and sort of circled it back on itself, you would get a form that looks like this. So the, this circle represents granite pavers, which are used in a lot of um, New York City parks that are inset in concrete. Um, jump around a little bit to, sh to get to the rendering. So this is a rendering of the new site, the tower, the towers remain the same, the wave canopy remains the same, but what's different is now it's more of a sort of welcoming space and the seating has changed a bit to move from a platform kind of design to an amphitheater design with these uh, stone blocks and also um, park benches as well. Um, one thing that we're aware of and that we're still working on is the, the coloring of the granite pavers. You might see a few different tones here. I'm interested in using two tones of granite paver, probably a light color and a, a darker color. Uh, Cold Spring Black is used quite a bit in, in New York City. And I love referencing 
some of the elements of infrastructure um, in, in New York um, in my design, but then you know contrast that with a with a lighter color. But you know that plays off the metaphor of the East River being an estuary where fresh water and salt water are meeting and sort of mingling and giving rise to this turbulence, which will in turn give rise to sound that comes out of the sculpture. Here's another rendering from another view to give you a sense of the experience. Um, my intention is that folks can come to the site to um, enjoy the sound, enjoy the view of the river, enjoy the view of, I guess it's kind of like Queens across the way a little bit. And the sound coming from this uh, sculpture is, is not extremely loud. It's not an overpowering sound. It's not the kind of sound that you'll hear across the entire expanse of the Harlem River Greenway. It will be designed such that it's a very localized experience so that if you're within this area, you can, of course, enjoy the sound. And if it's something that you choose not to take part in, you could simply walk away just a few feet. So these are some examples of the materials we're considering. Certainly granite is a um, durable material. Um, especially close to the uh, waterfront where we do have salt water considerations to take into account. I'm considering one of the darker colors like the Masabi black or a cold spring black. Um, in our conversations with park, the parks department last week, we learned that the black toned granite looks very, really great near concrete. And of course I wanna contrast that with another color whether it may be sort of a reddish color or a grayish color or this Lake Placid blue with that, which has very fine speckles of, uh, of a dark blue, which might kind of um, build on the associations I'm making with water. But there will only be two colors. I'm going to skip over the lighting concept. This uh, was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. And I want to talk about maintenance a little bit. Um, as I described, the uh, organ pipes are enclosed in the four towers. There are perforations to allow the sound to transmit from each of the towers. Um, I'll eventually create a design book and maintenance guide. I've been receiving mentoring from one of the artists who created a, a wave organ in Blackpool, UK, that's been in operation for over 15 years. So I'll create a maintenance book based off of um, the engineering and design that goes into this final sculpture, but is also looking into prior art as well. There will be an access panel, I think, routinely, if there is any blockage of the pipes, because as we know, this is interacting with the waterways and there is pollution in our waterways. It doesn't require um, special maintenance. It just requires a, a back, a sort of a pressurized backflow of water that one can do with a basic pressure washer. Um, so I'll have an access panel to allow that activity to happen. And I'm interested in creating a maintenance fund um, for this project that would allow for any uh, special maintenance to take place, whether it's uh, routine uh, greasing of the access panel door so it doesn't get fused shut over a long time or, um, or maintenance of any of the components that kind of go beyond what the parks department normally does. A lot of my activity in uh, 2022 will be focused on the maintenance fund and education and outreach efforts. My, my um, efforts this year are focused on completing the design and um, getting engineering review and approval of the designs by the end of this calendar year. One thing I'd like to explore is a coordination with uh, New York City Parks Citywide Monuments Conservation Program. There is a structure in place in our city for uh, uh, an organization to administer a maintenance fund. So if I, I raise this, this money, this organization could administer the funds and. I could work with them to develop a plan for um, when maintenance would occur and how the contractors um, would be engaged and so on and so forth. So that's something I, I would like to explore. I know it is not a typical um, activity that happens with um, public artwork in New York, but I do think because of the interactive and dynamic nature of this project, I want to be proactive um, to ensure that um, this project has a really long and beautiful and robust life and the sound is always something that people want to come and enjoy. 
Um, community and neighborhood context. Um, right now, I'm really deep in design phase, um, working with Star White House and Langan and uh, the fabricators I engage in, also the engineering company to um, really focus on the design details and optimize the design. Um, but I am doing some cultural um, and community engagement. Um, the sound artist, Zane Rodolfo, who's I've been working with to select the organ pipes, actually a very funny kind of a side story. He discovered a barn when he was camping one weekend in Ghent, New York, that's full of organ pipes. It was owned by some folks who used to basically collect organ pipes and they've agreed to donate organ pipes to our sculpture. Um, so we're um, in our experimentation with those pipes. Um, Zane was commissioned by the Guggenheim Museum to create an original score of music for one of their presentations in uh, this coming October. Um, so we'll actually be using some organ pipes um, to create uh, kind of experimental music instruments that will be premiered and played at the Guggenheim. Um, and also I received a social practice grant by uh, CUNY and the Mellon Foundation to continue exploring this idea of sound sculpture and civic engagement. In general, my community engagement efforts uh, for this project will be focused on uh, the folks who will live close to the sculpture. Uh, so I'm in touch with some organizations like the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, the Caribbean Cultural Center and African Diaspora Institute, the Schomburg, Calabar Imports, and uh, the list is growing and there are more organizations that I hope to reach out to, especially in uh, 2022, when most of my focus will be on um, community engagement as I wait for uh, the site to be ready um, in late 2022, 2023. Uh, that's the end of my pr uh, presentation. I do have background slides that talk a little bit more about the project and my own background um, in public art, if folks are interested. We don't have public testimony, Sydney. Okay, fabulous. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, fascinating uh, proposal. Uh, I've, I've been to a couple of these sound organ uh, projects uh, in uh, well, never mind where. Um, I would I, I do think it's interesting uh, that you are taking this initiative uh, to raise funds uh, for the ongoing maintenance. And I I guess I I'm I'm trying to figure out maybe a, a chicken and egg situation. As do you feel that this piece requires um, more maintenance than the parks department has identified as being able to provide, or are you looking to supplement that because you think it may need it? I just need to understand a little background here on why you're going down this road. I think I'm being uh, pretty proactive um, there aren't any, there are essentially no moving parts. So nothing that's necessarily gonna wear down. The entirety of the sculptures, with the exception of the organ pipes will be stainless steel, uh, 316 stainless steel, which is robust against marine environments. Uh, the, the pipes that go below grade, they may be um, PVC, which is, again, it uh, will not corrode or anything like that. Um, with regards to what is within the scope or what may exceed what the parks can do, from my understanding and learning from the Blackpool UK Tide Organ, what I think is important is that uh, periodically, maybe once, maybe twice a year, someone opens an access panel, greases up the access panel, flushes the valves, things of that nature. Um, so again, it's not a, uh, a highly specialized activity, you know, um, but I think with a maintenance fund, I can ensure that, you know, we can contract someone to do it and there won't necessarily be an argument about, you know, who's doing it or how should it be done. Of course, there will be a manual for it to be done, but uh, I, I think I'm just being really proactive and maybe really protective of this artwork. But again, it's it's really a simple task, something that could be done 
in a few hours once or twice a year. So we're not talking about highly specialized maintenance. We're not talking about something that requires a great deal of monitoring or attention. Um, thank you. Uh, I noticed that you went so far as to suggest who might be the recipient of these funds. And I, I guess I, I'm now gonna look to Parks um, to see whether they, they feel that this initiative that the artist is taking on is something that, that actually you can um, work with. So this is Nancy. This is oh, I'm very sorry for the echo. Um, no, it's fine, Nancy. It's okay. fine. This is Nancy from Parks, and we've accepted the artwork, um, the proposal for the artwork, um, just on its own. Um, but uh, you know, we're always interested in in having artworks come with maintenance funds. So we will work with the artist um, um, to um, you know continue his effort and figure out how we can manage that. Any donated money. You know, there's a, I know Jonathan Kuhn has um, different funds he pulls from, so I'm sure he's going to have something. But I just want to let you know that we did accept the work, you know, without uh, a special maintenance fund. As but we're way. very happy <laughs> if there could be one. Great. Okay. Hi, Signe. Jonathan Kuhn, uh, we, right, we, since 1993, we've been able to through our nonprofit partner to establish dedicated funds. It'll vary depending on the situation. We deeply appreciate ATO's uh, uh, initiative. We haven't yet had substantive conversations, but we expect to. And it's uh, insurance, we hope it's insurance on top of routine care by the operations units of the agency. But um, I've seen every kind of situation where a light bulb can't be changed, <laughs> a single light bulb. And, you know, it seems easy, but there might be one person in the Bureau or something who's doing it, and so multiply it by hundreds of times. Uh, we see this as insurance, and we will work constructively. Indeed, we you may not know it, but we often work with artists who have created works in the past and in an informal basis also for decades sometimes uh, in terms of care of their own pieces during the duration of their lifetime. Uh, I have had conversations in the past five years with almost every living artist regarding care of their works in the park system. So uh, again, we're deeply appreciative and we'll work uh, collegially and substantially with the artist to uh, work on specific solutions to this design, which we have approved. Excellent. Very good to hear. Um, I think I saw Ricardo. Uh, you raised your hand. Ricardo Hinkle. Hold on one second. There. I, yes, I just wanted to add that um, Eto and Parks have worked very closely together in terms of selecting materials that are the most durable possible materials. So we were uh, we approved all the materials that Ento has used for his sculpture. Great, thank you. Um, all right, on to the substance of the uh, proposal. I, I just want to, I guess, say that I, I appreciate the removal of the uh, platform below, and I, I think that um, the design direction it's uh, showing right now uh, is indeed, I think, more not just inclusive, but I think also versatile. So thank you for that. I, I agree with that. I think it's nicely improved by the uh, changes you've made. It's quite beautiful. Anyone else? Uh, all right. If not, um, I am going to ask for the last vote of the day. So this will be a roll call vote on item number 27898 um, per usual. Uh, Please state your vote to approve, reject, table, or abstain. And if there's anything you want to do to contextualize your vote, please feel free. Uh, Phil. Approve. Ken Seth. Strongly approve. Okay. Karen. Approve. Manuel. Approve. Susan. Approve. Ethel. Approve. Meryl. Approve. And Mary. Mary left the meeting. Oh, sorry. And myself approved. So um, congratulations, team, and to the artist. Uh, job well done. Uh, unanimous approval. Thank you very much. And I think that with that, no banging of gavels required the meeting.